It's all it's right, all right to, be to be just a little bit crazy. Being, being creative, creative is being a little bit crazy in just, just the right vibration. vibration. With, that With that in mind, you should understand, should understand God's, God's completely insane. insane. <laughs>
you talk about God as if you are separated from God and we talk about God with the intention of bringing you into alignment and oneness with that which you call God and and mostly we don't use the word God because it takes you out of the vortex you you talk about God as one who punishes you've made God petty and immature and irrational and arbitrary and we know nothing like that in this vortex of creation there is only consistent eternal always offered unconditional love that is God you see and when you find something other than that you you've tuned into something different from that you see and so if we were standing in your physical shoes that is the spiritual guide we would be reaching for and your emotions will take you right to it you will find it through love you will find it through passion you will find it through eagerness and through happiness and through joy you will find it through trust you will find it through worthiness you will find it through satisfaction you will find it through reaching for ease and flow ease and flow in other words it's a feeling it's it's an emotion it it is a state of being which is represented to you by the way you feel This is where the physical mind once again can sometimes get caught up in its own sense of control. And that is that when we talk about the idea that what you put out is what you get back, the physical mind, because again of how it looks at physical reality being the only thing there is, will assume that if it doesn't see an exact one-to-one -one reflection in the circumstances that surround you with what it is you believe you're giving off you will think that something has failed look around life is a malady but you know you create your own reality to keep evil at bay just wish it away dealing with the new age paradigm get that new car if you wanna just visualize, get what you thought of. The secret is out, so no need to bow. Dealing with the new age paradigm. Unfortunately, there is just one problem that these new agers seem to have missed. You manifest the core beliefs in your focus. Hey, more on what you resist will persist. So called gurus and all the mimics seem to ignore the quantum physics. If you don't devotionally clear, you'll get it in the rear. Dealing with the new age paradigm. Love and light ain't gonna work well. With self-esteem, shot straight to hell Ignoring your own beliefs will bring you no relief Dealing with the new age paradigm When you judge yourself for holding judgment You create a negative feedback loop And the more that you try to ignore it You'll take a constipated paradigm peak. You are so smug, pushing and shoving The way you treat folks ain't so loving What part of this don't you get? You're a hypocrite Dealing with the new age paradigm You pretend you're happy, but you're always so sick People mention it, you claim they're a dick You get back what you put out of this have no doubt Dealing with the new age paradigm 
Please do not fear the Illuminati show. The globalists are not perfect gods. In fact, a more accurate description would be grown as three-year-old tantruming clods. Please be advised, this is not hearsay. You cannot just wish these people away. 5D, you will not earn if you just watch the world burn. Dealing with the new age paradigm. Be the change you want to create. Yes, we can. Don't just lay there and masturbate. Wishing won't let you pass, so get up off your ass. Dealing with the new witch paradigm. Again, I remind you, this is where you get caught in your own paradoxical trap. Even though it is true that what you put out is what you get back and that by being in a certain state of being that will determine what the circumstances around you are, the first stage of that, the first manifestation of that will be usually, especially in your world of space and time, usually the first reflection will look the same as it used to. Because this gives you an opportunity to reinforce the state of being by responding to the circumstances that look the same differently than you did before. And that is where you then allow the circumstances to truly reflect that you have changed and demonstrate that you truly have changed by responding to the circumstances differently even if they look the same as they used to. That's how it works. So first, the first reflection will usually be an echo of how it used to look. You must not respond to the echo as if that's the representation of your new state. You must respond to it, in a sense, as if you know it's just an echo and that what you're putting out now, the new response, to the old circumstances, that will solidify the vibration of your preferred state of being and truly allow the circumstances to change themselves and take their cue from the new vibration you're putting out, which is the absolute certainty that you are different. Because if you respond to the old echo in the same way you used to, you are not different. What do you want? What do you want? Hey, you want? Who's your daddy? What about your mom? different interests, different beliefs, different occupations, but for the most part they got along pretty well. Then one day a gang of a few hundred people showed up. Um, need to zoom in some more to see them. I know they're there somewhere. Zoom in. There! There they are! And this gang of a few hundred said to the throng of a hundred million, from now on you all have to give us a cut of everything you earn. This is an accurate graphical comparison between the number of American taxpayers and the number of U.S. congressmen. 
And the throng said, Gosh, do we have to give you a cut of what we earn? And the gang of a few hundred said, Yes, you have to. And the throng said, Well, okay, I guess we have to. And one little troublemaker asked, What if we don't? The gang of a few hundred didn't like this, and said, If you do not comply, we shall unleash upon you our legions of enforcers. And the throng cried, Oh no, please don't. We will comply, we will pay. This is an accurate graphical comparison between the number of American taxpayers and the total number of IRS employees. Time went by, and the gang of a few hundred said, Now we want more of what you earn. And this kept happening over and over again, until eventually some of the throng were paying almost half of what they earned to the gang. Whenever the gang demanded more, the throng would say, Golly, we're already having a tough time. Do we really need to give you even more? And the gang always said, Yes, you must, or we shall unleash our legion of enforcers. Now the gang of a few hundred was getting trillions of dollars every year, spending it on wars and pyramid schemes, giving away goodies to their friends, buying influence, and doing lots of other things. And some of the throngs started saying, We don't really like the war you're waging with the money we give you. Do we really have to be paying for that? And the gang said, Yes, we demand it. Don't make us send out our legion of enforcers. And some of the throng said, You're taking our money and giving it to huge corporations and giant banks. And some people who just don't want to work. A lot of these things we don't like. And the gang said, We don't care. We will decide how to spend it. You just do as you're told, or else. And the throng said, Okay, I guess we have to. But eventually the throng got so fed up, so angry, that they took a drastic step. One day they said to the gang, We don't like what you're doing. We want a new gang. And after pouring a huge amount of time and money into the effort, they replaced the gang with a new gang. Then the throng pleaded with the new gang, Now, at long last, can we keep our own money, or at least keep more of it? And the new gang said, Sorry, but after much discussion, we've decided that you can't. You have to keep giving us what you've been giving, in fact, a little bit more than before. The throng was distraught and said, This is dreadful. But after all, what choice do we have? I mean, they say we must comply, and they have that scary legion of enforcers. We're powerless against them. We'd better just do as we're told. So they did as they were told, got poorer and poorer, and lived miserably ever after. But after all, what else could they have done? What power could this throng possibly have compared to this gang of a few hundred and their enforcers? What chance would this thing have against this thing. How could these hundred million people ever hope to successfully resist the awesome power of this tiny little dot? In case anyone missed this, let's review. Here's them. Here are their enforcers. Here's us. Them. Us. Them. Us. Does anything about this seem just a little strange to you? Are you perhaps wondering, why does the throng need the permission of the dot to do anything? Why do these people feel the need to ask this tiny little dot if they can keep more of what they earn? Why would they spend year after year literally begging for lower taxes from this little dot? Is this dot just really darn intimidating? Is it very persuasive in its reasoning? To be blunt, why would this throng give a rodent's backside what this tiny little dot wanted? The fact that this tiny dot has the gall to issue such demands to such a throng is pretty startling in and of itself. But what is far more amazing is that the throng obeys this minuscule little parasitic gang of control freaks. What could possibly explain this? Let's ask the dot. Uh, this is how it works. When we, the dot, 
take your money and spend it on things you don't like, we're representing you. In fact, though you're not allowed to actually keep your own money, you're allowed to decide which little dot will steal half of what you earn. So that really means that you're in charge and that you're agreeing to give us your money. In fact, we, the dot, are serving you when we take your money and spend it on things you don't like. And so you should thank us and treat us with great respect and honor for having robbed you on your behalf for your own good in order to serve you by doing things you don't want us to do. So there you have it. I hope that cleared everything up for you. Debunking the Debunkers. We would like to begin this idea, this transmission, this night of your time, by discussing something that we have labeled debunking the debunkers. Talking about the gullible, the skeptical, the cynical. The idea has been expressed many times on your planet that there are unusual phenomenology that occur from time to time that many individuals on your planet either do believe or do not believe are occurring. Obviously, there are certain things that are perhaps misinterpretations of certain things. This can happen, obviously. Not every single thing that someone may think is a certain thing is a certain thing. Nevertheless, the idea of finding balance within your investigations and your relation to the idea of unusual phenomenon in your world is one that requires a clear, concise approach to remain in balance. And the idea is that what you call being skeptical is in and of itself a natural, healthy point of view, especially for your world, where there are so many deceptions that may occur on your planet, so many different agendas that may occur, and that individuals may wish to take advantage of others. Therefore, remaining skeptical can, in your world, be a healthy thing to do. However, the idea is that skepticism, by definition, is an open-minded state of a willingness to explore something, a willingness to look at what you call evidence, a willingness to understand your relationship to it, your personal relationship to it, and a willingness to allow for a new belief to come in to challenge the old belief you may have been holding on to. Not the idea that you must change your belief, but a willingness to allow for the possibility that your beliefs, be they long held or cherished, may nevertheless require some change. The idea, of course, is that on polar opposite sides of the balance point of skepticism are the issues of gullibility and cynicism. We have said once before that cynicism, the formula for cynicism is C-I-A. Cynicism equals ignorance plus arrogance. <laughs> now, the understanding is that Unlike the idea of open-minded skepticism, where you are willing to investigate, willing to take in new information, open to the possibility of changing your point of view, <clears throat> cynicism is that which has its mind made up, has a belief system and an agenda totally intact and is unwilling to change. The idea being, therefore, that cynicism dismisses any new ideas that may challenge the paradigm that exists within. Gullibility, for most of you, means being open to accepting just about anything without any kind of filtration system, without any kind of discernment. The idea, however, is to recognize a fascinating fact about the polar opposites of gullibility and cynicism. They are not polar opposites. They are different versions of the same thing. Gullibility also has cynicism within it. Cynicism also contains a great degree of gullibility. Allow us to explain. The fundamental similarity between gullibility and cynicism is the same issue. 
I believe what I believe, and nothing will change that, despite any evidence to the contrary. The gullible, in accepting everything without any kind of discernment, are actually saying the same thing. I have a belief system that I do not want to change no matter what. It's the same thing that the cynics say. I have a belief system I do not want to change no matter what. The gullibility inherent in cynicism is this. When a cynic often looks at the so-called evidence that may be brought before one, many times the cynic, while thinking that they are actually investigating the true evidence, the true story, may simply be gullibly accepting the folk tale and using that and dismissing that as if they are dismissing true scientific evidence when in fact all they're doing is saying the folk tale may not be actually representative of what's actually going on and therefore because the folk tale is not true the reality must also not exist and so by saying that by approaching it that way the cynic has actually gullibly swallowed the general folk tale that has been put forth by individuals who may in fact be gullible so in that sense, the gullible and the cynical have a connected relationship, a marriage of sorts, and they feed off each other, all pushing away from each other in that sense, leaving the idea of skepticism in the center. So all we are basically suggesting here is that you, in your investigation of anything that you may hear that seems unusual in your world, Allow yourselves to remain in the center, in balance, with your investigation as to whether or not it means something to you, whether or not it ought to be incorporated into your belief system structure, whether or not it really serves you in a positive, beneficial way. And allow yourself to maintain a sense of discernment as to what is and what is not appropriate for you. Now. Of course, we understand there are many different points of view, many different belief systems, and for each and every individual, whatever belief system they are holding to be true for themselves at any given moment is true for them at that moment, even if it seems contradictory to another. But the only reason we are discussing the issues of gullibility and cynicism in this context is because very often the idea of those who are gullible and accept everything and those who are cynical and accept nothing often attempt to push that point of view on others. So if you are going to have a particular point of view that you believe is contradictory to anyone else's point of view, by all means you are entitled to create that for yourself. But understand, you are not entitled to create that for anyone else. Is this the right open argument? I've told you once. No, you haven't. Yes, I have. Well, just now. You did not. I'm sorry, is this a five minute argument or a full half hour? Oh, oh, just the five minute one. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, I did. You most certainly did not. Now, let's get one thing quite clear. <laughs> I most definitely told you. You did not. Yes, I did. You did not. Yes, I did. Didn't. Yes, I did. Didn't. Yes, I did. Look, this is an argument. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. It's just contradiction. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. It is not. It is. <laughs> No, I didn't. Oh, you did? No, 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 no. You did, just then. No, no, nonsense. Oh, look, this is futile. No, it isn't. I gave me a good argument. No, you didn't. You gave me an argument. Well, an argument's not the same as contradiction. Can be? No, it can't. An argument's a collective series of statements to establish a definite proposition. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. It isn't just contradiction. Look, if I argue with you, I must take up a contrary position. But it isn't just saying, no, it isn't. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. <laughs> Argument's an intellectual process. Contradiction is just the automatic game saying of anything the other person says. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. Not at all. No, no. I... Thank you. Thank you. What? That's it. Morning. Oh, you're just getting interested. Sorry, the five minutes is done. <laughs> that was never five minutes just now. Right, it was. No, it wasn't. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not known to argue anymore. What? If you want me to go on arguing, I'll have to pay for another five minutes. But that was another five minutes just now. Oh, come on. This is ridiculous. I'm very sorry, but I told you.